Welcome to the second session of the day here at the Nexa Front Lawn. The session is called Akbar and Dara. It's presented by the Murti Classical Library of India of the Harvard University Press. And the speakers today are Supriya Gandhi, Mani Mukta Sharma, and they'll appear in conversation with William Dalrymple. Supriya Gandhi is a historian of Mughal India and teaches in the Department of Religious Studies at Yale University. She is the author of The Emperor Who Never Was, Dara Shuko in Mughal India. Mani Mukta S. Sharma is a Delhi-based journalist with the Times of India and is the author of Allahu Akbar, Understanding the Great Mughal in Today's India, a non-fiction title that looks at the life and times of Emperor Akbar from a modern perspective. And last but not least, founder and co-director of the, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, William Dalrymple is the best-selling author of many titles, the most recent of which are The Anarchy, The Relentless Rise of the East India Company, which I believe was recommended by Obama recently, and The Forgotten Masters, Indian Painting for the East, India Company. Please join me in giving our guest a very warm welcome. Welcome. Um, ten years ago, uh, I wrote in the New York Review of Books that there was an odd absence of biography uh, of leading historical figures in India. Ten years ago, you could go to Bari Sands in Khan Market uh, and ask if there was a recent biography of any pre-colonial uh, uh, ruler of India, and you would have been told no. You could have had to go back to the Victorian era uh, for, uh, uh, for a biography. But in the last 10 years, we've seen an incredible um, flourishing of non-fiction of all forms uh, in India. Publishing is now dominated in this country by non-fiction titles, and among them, we have some extraordinary works of history and some extraordinary works of biography. Uh, and this year, we've seen two uh, extraordinary books, uh, one uh, by Mani on Akbar and one by Supriya uh, on his great-grandson, Dara Shuko. Uh, there are, I think there's also been another book on Akbar this year and another book on Dara. We could have had a foursome uh, on stage uh, uh, with, with this. But there's, there's, it's, it's suddenly um, this, this uh, uh, tradition of non-fiction biography uh, is, is flourishing with incredible uh, uh, vigor in this country. Uh, why do you think that is, Supra? Why, why uh, uh, are we suddenly seeing these biographies appearing now when we didn't for the first 70 years of independent India? Uh, you know, I think, I think some of us might have... Please, uh, testing. Does this work? Yeah. Uh, some of us might have read your... Uh, well, I can tell you about myself. Uh, you know, I remember reading uh, your complaint about there not being biographies, and somehow, sort of, that uh, settled into the, back, into the back of my mind. Uh, but it wasn't the only reason that I wrote my biography. Uh, the story of Dara and Aurangzeb uh, is really a foundational myth uh, of this for the subcontinent uh, and I wanted to tell it as a story and initially uh, one of the, the early forms in which I wrote this was uh, co-writing this as a dastan, as a form of storytelling. Uh, so I think these biographies have emerged uh, also in the context of a larger cultural interest in the Mughals uh, and in Indo-Islamic culture. Do you feel that the, I mean traditionally in this country history departments have been dominated since independence by the left. And traditional mm -hmm. historiography coming from a Marxist and, and leftist perspective has tended to emphasize historical and economic forces over the, what's considered the slightly old-fashioned form of biography, right. which represents the history as being the acts of great men uh, and, and, and a series of battles and so on. Do you yes, think that academia is losing its suspicion of biography, or did you feel you were actually taking a risk professionally by writing uh, a biography, even though possibly a populist biography? Yes. Uh, well, I must say, it was somewhat of a risk. Uh, there is, um, of course, a discomfort with the genre that was popularized in colonial times of 
either celebrating or denigrating these great men. So you have um, an idea of history that it's a rather old fashioned and outdated idea of history. The history is populated by these, uh, these, th these great figures who are either you know, wonderful enlightened rulers or they're despots, they're almost always men and they tend to embody their age. And of course history is about a whole lot more than that. So I think the kinds of historiography that you're talking about were really a necessary corrective. But what I wanted to do was... Dick I think Eaton, um, in his uh, Deccan yes, biographies, of course. made the case very strongly that this was something which uh, Indian academics should be looking at, and which was oddly absent from the field. Um, absolutely. So I think there are, there are fresh ways of approaching biography. Uh, there are ways of weaving in lesser known and marginal figures, and certainly for a, for a writer, for a figure such as Dara, who was just so prolific, biography is a way in which one can understand his intellectual trajectory and how his writings related to the political context of the times. So, so it, through the genre of biography of narrative history, one can really weave in political, social, economic, and intellectual history in this wonderful way. Mani, what, what brought you to, I mean, up to now, you've, you've been more, in a sense, labeled as a journalist rather than a historian. Um, what, what led you to make this change from, from, from writing about the present day to writing about the past? Well, I'm still a journalist, and I'm an author of history now, so my journalist identity has not receded. Um, I wrote about it, I wrote about Akbar, I never thought that I would, but then uh, since 2014, there were so many conditions that made it important to write about Akbar and Mughals and, of course, other rulers as well. And if I can just also uh, tag to the first question that you asked, there are so many biographies today because now there's a regime and there's a political climate that constantly uses the past to justify present outrage. So there is an increasingly tendency among authors to come up with biographies of contentious uh, characters of history. Who are you thinking of? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't it obvious? He who cannot be named, and of course, others. <laughs> no, no, we're allowed to mention Lord Voldemort here. <laughs> So, uh, in 2015, uh, you had a spokesperson of the ruling party uh, who announced that Akbar was as much a tyrant as was Adolf Hitler. And uh, that was specifically the comment that triggered a response from many people, and I was just one among them. And I wrote a, a couple of articles in the Times of India busting that. And uh, the understanding of the past is, of course, shared by our president. This comment was the biggest proof possible for that. And uh, so I started looking at Akbar, and because I wrote these articles, and somebody, uh, my publishers got interested, and they in fact asked me if I could expand on that thought in, in the form of a book. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't written a, a proper biography. I have, in fact, tried to look at the past to the present, and I have also compared the past with the present. So that was pretty much my idea, and uh, to clear doubts and dispel myths. So, so let's grab the bull by the horns. In Rajasthan, we're in a state where uh, Akbar is not necessarily regarded uh, as the, 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 the symbol of tolerance, of goodness. Akbar the Great, one of the, one of the two greats of Indian history, along with Ashoka. Mm -hmm. um, how fair is the grouse of the right that uh, Akbar, in his youth, was a mass murderer responsible for uh, the slaughter of thousands at Chittor? Well, um, well in, in the 17th century, in the 16th century, even up to the 18th century, the Rajput depictions of Akbar were very sympathetic. They were not outright negative. If you leave aside Mewar, uh, of course, but even when the Mewaris were writing their history, Akbar was being, the, the battle between Akbar and Rana Pratap was being depicted as a clash between Karan and Arjun. Karna and Arjun. So if uh, Akbar could be compared to that, so you could very well imagine that the understanding of Akbar in that age was very different. In uh, some sources, even Akbar is talked of in Rajasthan as an incarnation of Lord Ram. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Ram Avatar, the Kaushalya Putra, that's how he is referred to, and uh, an avatar of Vishnu. So, uh, and in fact, there were many other Muslim rulers who were depicted as such. For instance, if you go to Bengal, and you had uh, two great rulers that came one after the other, Alauddin Hussain Shah and his son Nusrat Shah. So they were, Alauddin Hussain Shah in particular was referred to as uh, the Nipati, and, uh, and the, his beauty is compared to that of Lord Kama, and his wrath is described as uh, the one 
that Lord Yama uh, used to inflict on his enemies. So these are the descriptions that we get. So obviously the, the black and white understanding of uh, historical characters that we have today was not so back in the past. And uh, in Chitor, of course, Chitor is considered to be the crowning glory of Akbar. And there's a very uh, uh, descriptive... Uh, by who? Uh, by the Mughals, of course, yeah. yes. And Chitor was considered to be an invincible fort. So, uh, and it stood in the way because the Mughals were also trying to control those trade routes that brought in the war horses from Central Asia, from West Asia, the Arab horse or the Iraqi horse. So um, Chitor was very important to you know, take control of. And in fact, it was also Alauddin Khilji who had done that before Akbar. And so we see in, in the depiction of Abul Fazal that constantly Alauddin Khilji is being invoked and Abul Fazal is trying very hard to prove that his master, the Emperor Akbar, is even greater than Alauddin Khilji. Because Alauddin Khilji took six months to conquer Chitor, Akbar took just five months. And uh, if Alauddin Khilji killed 8,000 people, Akbar killed 30,000 people. But later on in the narrative, he contradicts himself, where he says that most of the people who were uh, defeated were taken prisoner, they were not killed, even though earlier, in the earlier part, he says that 30,000 people were massacred. So you see that there's also this comparison, this competition which is going on. Alauddin Khilji was doing the same with Alexander, calling himself Sikandar Esani, so he wanted to outdo Alexander. So you always have these people who are trying to outdo others, which is why we, we see today, we, we have people even today who try to compare themselves with Sayyid Nehru and all these people and go even prove that they were even better than the past rulers. Are there good uh, Rajput sources from the time describing the, the, the attack on Chitto, reliable sources from the Rajasthani side? Yes, there are. In fact, uh, uh, of course, there is a lot of sympathy that is uh, assigned to, uh, to the Rajput side in the sources. Um, you have sources like Veer Vinod that talk about this uh, general history of Rajputana. And, and uh, so uh, the depiction is, of course, more sympathetic to the Rajputs and the Rajput sources, but then it's not outrightly negative uh, when it comes to the Mughals. And uh, I have focused primarily on Abul Fazal and Veer Vinod. Uh, these are the sources that I have consulted. You've, I mean, I've always been very irritated by Abul Faisal. I, I've always, I long to to um, read about Akbar by someone that knew him very intimately. And in, in that sense, Abul Faisal is an extraordinary source because there's so much, so many volumes. Uh, but his sort of incredibly sycophantic, it's the worst sort of Delhi sort of uh, uh, matlabi sort of uh, uh, oleaginous text gr dripping with sycophancy. Do you, uh, did he put you off writing about him or not? Well, that was a style back then, so uh, <laughs> if I were to complain, which I have occasionally. In, in some <laughs> newspapers today, it's the style today when... <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and in some TV stations too. Of we course. won't name Republic TV at any point. Unless, <laughs> <laughs> and let's not talk about newspapers. I work in a newspaper, so... <laughs> So, oh yes, but uh, that was pretty much the style back then. And if, in fact, even the Sanskrit sources or the Hindu sources, if you may call them. So even they uh, are very similar in nature, the way the king is glorified. And of course, at every bit, the monarch is, try is being pleased. And that style, of course, Abul Fazal also has. So there has been, in fact, uh, a lot of debate on this. But of course, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, when, for instance, when Vincent Smith was writing uh, uh, Akbar the Great Mughal. So he complains about the style, and uh, so does um, Beveridge. He also, in his preface, he writes that the style is very psychophantic and all that. And I'm told that the new Wheeler Thaxton translation of, of uh, Abul Faisal is less irritating than, That's than the more other modern. Yeah. That's more modern, of course. So obviously, there you would see the result. But of course, uh, uh, while talking about this, there were still people back then. For instance, Lala Lajpat Rai, who was a great nationalist leader of the Congress and of the Hindu Mahasabha as well. So he wrote a review of uh, Vincent Smith's Akbar, the Great Mughal, uh, in the Political Science Quarterly. And at that time, the First World War was going on, and he was in America. And uh, so he criticizes Vincent Smith for being harsh on Akbar. He says that Vincent Smith, while writing an extend biography, he has still missed the point because he has completely taken the context out of, uh, of Akbar. So he was, he's, you are criticizing him from the modern perspective, from the modern understanding of Akbar. You have completely ignored the past. So 
it was, of course, being criticized by people back then as well. So, so Priyat, how Akbar's decision to, um, to make the ruler of Amer, the, 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 the defeated ruler of Amer, the general of his army, was there any precedent for this? this? This way that he, having defeated the Rajputs, he builds them, he embraces them and, and, uh, and incorporates them into his state. Was there any pr precedent for that in the Sultanate? Uh, or was it an entirely new, uh, th th this, this reconciliatory and, uh, embrace of, of Rajput uh, uh, valor into his army? Was, was this a, a, a new thing? I think, yes. You know, so I'll, I'll have to sort of think a bit more about that. But, you know, certainly the extent uh, of uh, Akbar's inclusion of the Rajputs, uh, his actual uh, molding of his own, you know, even physical persona, you know, adopting a clean-shaven look, uh, entering into marriage alliances, uh, you know, I think certainly that uh, uh, that was indeed quite unique uh, and set an important uh, precedent for future Mughal rulers. There's that extraordinary inscription. Is it at Rotas in Bihar? Um, which is the, the fort that the, the, um, the Jaipur ruler gets sent to govern in Bihar? And there's Kathy Rotas, Rotas. Rotas. And Kathy Asher writes about this double inscription that he puts up. So he's now part of the Mughal uh, uh, mach uh, machine. He's been made governor of, of equivalent of uh, uh, chief minister of Uttar Pradesh uh, in, in modern terms. And he writes a double inscription over the gateway in Rotas. And there's one inscription in Persian that the Mughals will be able to read, saying the humble ruler of Amer uh, thanks the great Mughal for his, his, his generosity in, 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 in placing me here in, uh, in his lands. And then the Sanskrit inscription, which they presume that the Mughals would not have been able to read, uh, says that the great ruler of Amer uh, has single-handedly taken over uh, the whole of eastern India. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly building it up, but uh, uh, there is that sensation that uh, um, the, the Rajputs knew what they were doing and that they were taking advantage as far as they could uh, of a bad situation. Absolutely. They were, they were pretty much part of this empire building project of the Mughals. And uh, with uh, uh, Raja Man Singh, because he was elevated, he was the first Mughal commander, not just the Rajput commander, to, to have been elevated to the rank of 7,000 Mansab, Saat Hazari uh, Mansabdar. And he was also called uh, by the emperor his son, so Farzand. That's how he was being referred to by the emperor. And again, is this completely unprecedented? This is unprecedented, of course. And uh, so uh, you don't have to go as far as Rothas. If you just go to the Amir Palace here, there's an inscription uh, because of the palace that was built by Man Singh. So you have the inscription there, which is there in marble, where he invokes the greatness of the emperor Akbar. So it's still there. You don't have to go as far as Bihar. So uh, they were part of it, they were proud of it, as long as they were in power. Uh, after 1857, of course, there was a new reality uh, that took shape, that the Mughals were no longer there, and it was seen as, uh, uh, as an embarrassment that if you're, if you're related to the Mughals at one point. So a lot of these uh, Rajputana states, some of them in fact commissioned proper historians to write out the story uh, to write themselves out of the Mughal story, and in fact, even deny that they had married off their daughters to the Mughal harem. So, uh, this was the 19, late 19th century and early 20th century. But at reality. the time, it was it was a, a, a very pragmatic alliance. Absolutely, you were a Rajput, you, rather than a, a, a attrition your state in constant warfare with your powerful neighbour in Delhi. Absolutely, that you jump aboard and you take advantage of it. Absolutely, and you have, uh, in fact, there's, a, there's an instance that I have described in my book, which you, if you have seen the movie Jodha Akbar, you would also see, but in a very different way. So in one scene, Akbar is uh, you know, fighting with, with a must elephant, and he's trying to conquer him. This ha incident happens in Sanganer. And then the elephant goes berserk, and everyone else runs away, but it was Bharmal and his Rajputs who stand their ground, who don't flinch. And Akbar is very pleased with that, and he supposedly says that Nihal Fahim Kar, we will, I shall cherish you, I shall rear you, whatever is the meaning. And uh, so eventually, that's how the, the Amir was the first state to formally ally with the Mughals. And of course, after that, as and when the Mughal state kept on expanding one after the other, the states became part of it. And they were not embarrassed about it. It was only later, but as long as the Mughals were in power, they had absolutely no qualms. The reality, it always seems to me, that is sort of lost in, in, in modern Indian 
understanding of history, as certainly as reflected in the Twitter sphere and, and, the, and the kind of angry, uh, uh, the angry historians of Twitter, is the degree to which the Mughals sent Hindu armies to fight Muslim states in the Deccan. So that you're constantly getting um, uh, Rajputs fighting and beating Muslims in, in Ahmednagar, Bijapur, uh, and, and later Golconda. Um, uh, and, uh, and in a sense, these are Hindu victories over Muslims. Um, do, you think that's, uh, do, you, do you think this is something which has been lost from the, from the uh, understanding? Or? Today it is, yeah. but back then it was not. And they were not seen as Hindu commanders, really, um, because these were imperial officers who were going, and their religion was just one aspect of their identity. Of course, we do see certain differences. For instance, when uh, we talk about the campaign against Mewar, especially against Rana Pratap, and Barauni is writing his book, and then he's, he's very upset that uh, because he, had, he wanted to be part of the campaign, though he was not a soldier. So, and his, his boss refused, saying, why do you want to go there? Because it's a Hindu who is the commander. That's what Barani writes. And he opposes that. He says that as long as he is serving the emperor, he is wielding the sword of Islam, I have no problems. And that pragmatic understanding that the, he had, somebody as bigoted as Barani, I think it uh, illustrates the point that they didn't see people as Hindus or Muslims. They were just imperial officers who were taking uh, uh, the campaigns. But you definitely get an impression in the art of Miwa that uh, there's a, there's a, in the British Library now, there's a fantastic uh, uh, Miwa Ramayana. And the army of Ravana are all dressed in Mughal dress. Uh, and uh, 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 and it's, very, it's very clear that the Mughals are being associated with demons. Right, with Mewar, it was, of course, the story was very different because Mewar, and in fact, the Mewaris didn't like the fact that other Rajputs had to send their daughters to the, to the Mughal harem. And it was considered to be a, a prestigious thing. And uh, even later, I mean, I have heard this from people that uh, those who had allied with the Mughals for a very long time afterwards, in the 20th century, yes, uh, they wouldn't really desist from having matrimonial alliances. Really? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And as the governor of Rajasthan, v uh, governor of Punjab, VPS Badnor, who said that recently, because his marriage to uh, another family uh, was a bit problematic because there was this thing that from our, from our place, that Doli would not go to that, really? that prince because they were allies of the Mughals. So, so talk a little bit about Akbar's tolerance. In the, in the kind of old Neruvian textbooks uh, from the 1950s, Akbar is made out to be this sort of fantastically liberal figure who, who kind of represents almost a kind of Neruvian secularism. How far is that an imposition of a modern idea on a far more complex figure? Uh, or is it actually a reality? No, it is definitely a modern idea because secularism and all these concepts are very, very modern concepts. So these have been retrospectively applied on the Mughals. In fact, I had also asked Supriya in my interview with her for the Times of India on Dara Shoko, should we call, should we call him a secular? And she had also very clearly said that, of course, these were later terms that were applied on the Mughals. So do you want, do you want to answer that question? Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, yeah, so I do think it's a bit anachronistic to call Akbar or Dara Shukur, say, liberal or secular. But there's no saying that, I mean, certainly these figures uh, helped in developing our own modern concepts of secularism, uh, you know, and you know, uh, similar currents of thought in the subcontinent. Amartya Sen, in, in his essays, talks about how... Um, uh, it's better to look at Akbar really as, as, as a figure, in a sense, more like the Enlightenment, that he was constantly looking for reason. Uh, he wanted to distinguish the firm ground of reason, he wrote, against the marshy land of tradition, which is something rather different, obviously, from secularism. Different from secularism, but part of his self-fashioning uh, as a ruler, as a powerful sovereign. And, and again, this, talk about the, a little bit, so prayer about the the great religious gatherings uh, in, in Akbar's Fatipur Sikri court. Uh, Amartya Sen, in his essays, very much presents them as you know, like a, a kind of uh, 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 an interfaith discussion group. Is that, is that a modern, um, is that a modern uh, take on it, or, or do you think that represents the actual reality? Well, it represented 
the reality uh, in the sense that there were representatives from uh, a variety of groups. There were Shias, you know, there were, there were Jesuits, there were, there were certain Brahmins, there were Jains, and so on. Uh, and, but the way these discussions worked was that uh, it was the emperor who was really bringing about harmony. They showed the emperor in, in a good light. He is the one who is actually quelling the discord in the kingdom and bringing about the right balance that was necessary for peace and stability. So, in a sense, it was less a religious discussion group than a, than a political exercise in, in, in bringing different traditions together into one, uh, into one state? Or? A, bit both, a, a bit of both, I'd say. Hold it one inch. Okay. Um, talk a bit more about that. What was Akbar after when he was doing these, these inter-faith inter discussion groups? How did he, how, what, what was in it for him? Was it, was it curiosity or, or was it a part of statecraft? Well, I think uh, it, was, it was partly curiosity uh, and it was partly an agenda uh, of, uh, of his own rule, really, uh, which was to distill the truths about various religious traditions. So for instance, in Akbar's uh, translations that he commissioned you know, of, the, uh, of the Mahabharata, for instance. The Razumnama. Yes, the Razumnama, or of Abu Fazl's kind of, you know, so, sort of enormous gazetteer of uh, Indian religions and you know, all kinds of curiosities about, uh, about Akbar's regime. Uh, the, um, the goal behind this, as stated by Abu Fazl, uh, was to was to actually quell critics and uh, sort of ignoramuses on either side. So it was to, uh, to, to quell the ideas of Muslims who might have been critical of various Hindu practices, and it's also to help to tell Hindu practices uh, what the best practices were and what the best ideas were. Uh, and and we'll, uh, there's much debate, I know, among historians on, on Dini Hilahi. Uh, is it, is it a, a new faith or... Or, or is it a kind of club at court? Or what's your take on that? Um, it was uh, a Pir or Murshid tradition. Uh, we cannot really call it a religion, per se. Um, it was a, a cult, a creed, uh, with the emperor at the center of it and uh, his, his murids, his chelas all around him. And uh, because it was also a political project, uh, as Supriya said, it was as much about religion as it was about politics. And uh, so people would have to, they can follow their own religions, but if they are a follower of this, so the, the emperor is the center of the universe for them, and all their loyalties will come first to the emperor, then to anyone else, or anything else. So uh, this, of course, he could not enforce. It was not something that could have been enforced. And uh, there were also a lot of juicy stories about what the emperor was doing with his clique of uh, nobles. And uh, one of them was, and only Barani writes about it, Abul Fazl doesn't mention, that he even came up with a different kalma, which is very central to Islam, where the emperor was the one who had replaced the prophet. And it was only for the harem to follow, and nobody else was asked to do that. So, um, but out of that, and in fact, at the Ibadat Khana, the conversations that were happening, the Ibadat Khana, in fact, had a very interesting origin because it was originally a khanqa of, of, of a peer who then became a Shiv Bhakt. And from that building, the whole concept of Ibadat Khana began and was expanded, of course. And, and a lot of these people were being you know, played by Akbar. So as, as she said, that so he would, if there were Muslim hardliners there, so he would get somebody from another religion to, you know, talk them down and, you know, uh, defeat their theories. And, and he was also having a lot of fun because, uh, you know, what liberals today are accused of by hardliners that they mock our faith. You know, they make fun of our orthodox behavior. Akbar was doing exactly that. You know, he would make fun of people having long beards. He would make fun of having people who were, you know, have that mark uh, that you get after praying for long. And uh, so all these things he was doing. So, and there were others who were laughing. So he, again, in the old textbooks, he's always made to seem a slightly pious figure. You get the impression of a mischievous Akbar. Uh, yes. I mean, see, he, he believed in two things, of course. One is the sulhe kul concept, which is a peaceful coexistence, universal tolerance. The other is rahe akla, because you cannot subject anything. I, you, he will not subject his rationality, his reasoning, to dogmas of faith. So these were the two cornerstones of Akbar. And he, which he wanted others 
in his court to follow as well. And uh, also, he loved the yes-men. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, people who agreed with him, he you know, loved them, he cherished them. People who opposed him, of course, he humiliated them publicly. So he was also doing all, all sorts of things. So it's a very, uh, if you want to project the image of a pious ruler, yes, he did try to do that because he was going to the Chisti shrine of uh, 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 Moinuddin Chisti in Ajmer. But there was also a political reason behind that because for 15 years he kept on going because all the trade routes, all the war horses were coming from that. And Ajmer used to have this annual fair where all the best of war horses would come and he would buy. So this was also a political the, the reason. The precursor of the Pushka. Capital yes, Valley. precursor of that. So uh, it was a political project, and he projected the image of a pious man. At the same time, what he was doing in his court, he was courting the Jains, and he was very close to the Jains, and he was giving them awards, he was giving them titles, and in fact, he was also praying to their gods. There's a very powerful scene where, you know, Jahangir's daughter falls ill, and uh, so the Jain uh, priest who he was close to, um, he performs a ritual to Lord Adinath, and Akbar, Jahangir, and the rest of the court, they stand with folded hands, and after the ceremony gets over, the holy water is passed around, and you know, he washes his eyes, Jahangir washes his eyes with that holy water. So these are things which would be anathema to somebody who's, uh, very, uh, who has very strong ideas of, about Islam. A Muslim ruler cannot, is not expected to do all that. But Akbar was doing that, Jahangir was doing that. Supri also mentions some part of that in her book, in the intro where Jahangir talks about, you know, that, to uh, Sir Thomas Rowe, that if Moors, Muslims, mm -hmm. Christians, all are welcome in my court, I tolerate everyone. So Priya, let's move on to Dara yeah. now. Sure. So how far was Dara Shuka looking at his great-grandfather as a model? Are they similar figures or do you think they're very different? And I, I think they're very similar figures, uh, but you know, one important point to note is that Dara Shoko was trying to place himself as this amazing future sovereign who had spiritual gifts that no other ruler prior to him had. So he was modeling himself on Akbar, he was modeling himself on Jahangir, he was weaving into uh, his own project uh, various facets that, uh, that both Akbar had used, uh, as well as other Mughal rulers. So, so Dara, Dara was operating very much in the tradition of his forefathers, but uh, the argument that he was making was that he was unique, he was exceptional. I always find that with, with, that with Dara, that the more I read about him, the less I like him. So with some rulers like Bahadur Shah Zafar and with uh, Shah Alam, these are figures who are traditionally regarded as slightly hopeless, and the more you read about them, the more you respect them. But Dara mm -hmm. always seems like a very spoilt kid, um, coddled at court by Aurangzeb gets sent off to do the hard work in the Deccan, covered with, with honors by his father, showered with love by his father. Is that a fair picture or, or not, do you think? Well, I think... <sighs> So the difference between you know Dara and these uh, sort of these others kind of uh, other very very tragic figures uh, is that uh, uh, just you, you see the contrast uh, between uh, the prince Dara who is really groomed to take over the throne uh, and then you know one perhaps uh, does feel sympathetic to Aurangzeb who's away in the Deccan who gets who's constantly being micromanaged by his father and you know given sent all these letters and these orders uh, so I can see what you mean there. Uh, but, you know, I'd be a little cautious about believing that we can access the real Dara Shuko in terms of his personality. Uh, because do, we have any, do we have letters from him? What, what allows you to get closest to him in your research? Well, I think the, uh, the most that we have really is his own voice through his prolific writings. Uh, and these writings are self-aggrandizing. He is building himself up to first to be the most pious disciple of his Sufi peers uh, as a young Qadari Sufi prince. He is uh, also, later on, he uh, acquires these spiritual powers, and he, uh, you know, so he gives instructions for the spiritual path. Uh, and then he is thrilled with his discoveries of, of Indic texts that he thinks can help him unlock the secrets of the Quran. So, uh, Talk a little about yeah. that, the, the mingling of two oceans. He believes that the Puranas, are the secret texts mentioned in the Quran? 
Oh, oh. So, so this is actually an earlier, uh, oh, an, okay. uh, an earlier book. So in the 1650s, Dara Shoko has just returned from a grueling war in Kandahar. Uh, it was a military campaign that you know, was, a, was a disaster, but it was a disaster for many reasons. Aurangzeb failed, uh, failed uh, in Kandahar as well. And he comes back to Shah Jahanabad, to this new capital city that uh, his father and other members of the imperial family have, uh, have built, have had a role building. And he, um, he takes an interest in statecraft and whatever's going on, but another very, very key project for him uh, is to deepen his interest in Indic texts. And he starts off by having dialogues with teachers. Uh, on his way back from Kandahar, he meets uh, this Vaishnava ascetic Baba Lal Das somewhere near Lahore, and he holds a series of dialogues with, with Baba Lal, and, and he's, uh, he's an interested student, and he also uh, collaborates with this pundit from Banaras, Kavindra Charya Saraswati. So all of these are hosted in Shah Jahan's court, and, and Shah Jahan uh, plays an important role in this. He also gives handsome gifts to, to, uh, to these pundits and so on. So Dara Shoko um, starts by reading a range of Indic, Indic texts. He reads very, very widely, uh, and then he distills is, what he How's he essence. accessing it? They're already been translated into Persian, or so he's learning yeah. Sanskrit, or what? So some of these have been translated, you know, the, uh, like the previous Mughal translations. He doesn't really cite them. Uh, in some cases, he likes to produce his own translations, because, of course, that's the way of putting his own mark on, on the text. Again, he's, uh, he doesn't really want to be seen as following previous rulers. Is there any indication that he tried to learn Sanskrit himself? Uh, so, he doesn't talk about learning Sanskrit. I think the translation was really a multi-layered process. You know, so, you, so, so there would be pundits reading these texts uh, that, that Dara would choose in consultation with them, and then there would be some kind of oral translation in Hindavi, in a local North Indian, you know, in the vernacular that they spoke, uh, and then some scribes and others helping Dara uh, put this down in Persian. So I think he was, he was but he was very, he was familiar with lots and lots of Sanskrit terms that he believed uh, could have equivalence in Persian. Uh, you know, so, you know, Om being equivalent to Allah, for instance, Brahma being equivalent to the angel Gabriel, for instance. Uh, so he actually believed that, they, that these terms represented a truth that was translatable. You know. And the atmosphere at this time was, far, was becoming far more conservative. Under Shah Jahan, uh, the, the ulama gain in power, and you get, uh, and you get more orthodox figures rising up and clearly disapproving of all this. So Dara does talk about, uh, about annoying figures who don't really appreciate this kind of knowledge. Now, uh, you know, so, so that's uh, you know, some of the information that we have about this opposition. Uh, and I think it, you know, it can tell us a number of things. Clearly, there was some anxiety about producing this kind of knowledge. But on the other hand, uh, you know, it probably would have been absolutely fine uh, you know, had, uh, had Dara continued, for, uh, for instance. We don't really have evidence of you know, this concerted group whose sole job was to kind of criticize and censure uh, these religious experimentations in the court. And that's because uh, even in Shah Jahan's period, uh, you couldn't really isolate an alim, you know, uh, a, a Muslim religious scholar from, uh, you know, a noble or an aristocrat or somebody else. People held, had multiple roles. So it was really possible for someone to be a Sufi at the same time and a scholar of Islamic law. Uh, I think the difference is, you know, in those... Yes, we, we oppose those two today. Yes, uh, of course, but of this course. Was not, this was not the case at the time. No, no, absolutely not. Now... You, you very much paint this picture of Dara very politically conscious when he's, when he's doing his, his writings. Is the same true of Aurangzeb? Did Aurangzeb um, pose, uh, sort of make an image of himself as this very orthodox, severe, puritanical figure in opposition to Dara experimenting? Or do you think this was a genuine um, and deeply held belief of Aurangzeb after... Uh, by middle age, when, when he's become this slightly darker figure, he's given up his Hindu girlfriends. He, he's no longer patronizing music or, uh, or painting. So Aurangzeb, as a, as a prince, is a much more multi-layered figure than kind of the image that we have of him as this sort of fanatical bigot, you know, for instance. Uh, and uh, you, uh, and he, he does give us justification for that image. But uh, so, 
uh, so as a young prince, you know, there is, there's a suggestion that he too enjoyed art, that he might even have commissioned a magnificent album of paintings. Uh, he gives little clues. And in he his, loved music. And he loved music. And he gives clues in his letters that, you know, he even might have listened to music with Dara Shuko. Or, uh, you know, there's, there's this one letter where he kind of he talks in passing about how, you know, because of a, of a particular religious day, there was no music. But kind of give him the sense that ordinarily he would there have enjoyed, yes, uh, that. So we... And, and he does become a, a more severe figure in middle age. Is that a political move or is, is that a genuine sort of life change? So, so we actually see clues that Aurangzeb is talking about Dara Shuko, framing Dara Shuko as an infidel. We see clues during the battle of succession. Uh, so it's not something that we can wish away. On the one hand, during this time, Aurangzeb is reaching out to Rajput rulers. Uh, he's uh, very, very sensitive about how best to, uh, to actually establish links with them. He sends Brahmin envoys. He showers them with gifts. He talks about how he's going to follow in the footsteps of his forefathers and ensure religious harmony. One of the so, points that Audrey Trushka makes yeah. in her rather controversial book uh, is that uh, Aurangzeb employed more Rajputs than any previous ruler. Do, do you believe that? To be true? Uh, yes, yes, I would say so. And his large administration, uh, you know, of uh, necessity did uh, employ lots and lots of Hindus. So, so on the one hand, Aurangzeb was doing this, uh, and, he, and he's even going out of his way to talk about some kind of religious pluralism. But on the other hand, during the War of Succession, you do see suggestions that he is um, criticizing Dara's, uh, you know, Dara's religious experiments. But, he, but that doesn't coalesce into a really sort of strong, uh, uh, sort of unified narrative. You hear little snippets of this, but it really solidifies and crystallizes later on after he comes to the throne. So looking today, when, when we, we have these two figures who in this country have always been sort of pictured since the 1950s as the good Mughals, yes. uh, Akbar and, and Dara. Yes. Uh, do you, I mean, is that a, is that a, a, a realistic portrayal? Do you, do you see these as the, as the figures of, uh, uh, of benign liberalism, or, uh, or, or, or is Dara a far more self-interested um, politician? Well, Dara was hoping to become a future sovereign, you know, so, uh, so of course there's an element of self-interest there, you know, just as one has with Akbar. I think there's a lot we can learn from these figures. You know, I think Dara's intellectual generosity, uh, the way he really threw himself into trying to understand uh, these texts that, uh, you know, that, that were not necessarily familiar to him. You know, so I think there's, a, there's, there's, there's quite a bit that's inspiring there. At the same time, one oughtn't to overly romanticize him or sort of glorify uh, him as this. You know, he, 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 did, he didn't live in the age of liberal democracy. Yeah. Mani, what, what do you think is the importance of these figures today? I mean, they've become such political mascots today. I mean, they're, and they're being cooked around as, as political footballs, in a sense, between the two different parties. What do you, how do you think we should look at them? Well, um, unfortunately, uh, that critical look that academics uh, have or give to historical characters, we cannot ex expect the general public to have the same look. So even though we may not want it, but this kind of politics is going to go on. It has always been so, and it's going to be this way, even in future. Um, because people love to see things in black and white. I mean, it's human nature, right? Uh, you tend to always uh, behave in extremes. And especially because in India today, and after 1947, uh, when Pakistan became a reality, so any Muslim king, no matter how tolerant he may have been, no matter how remarkable his rule may have been, but for an average Indian today, if he's a Hindu, an average Hindu, I'm not talking about exceptions, but by and large, uh, he or she is unlikely to hold up a Muslim figure as a model to emulate. If it's a Muslim, there's always this feeling that, okay, it may be problematic to talk about a ruler like Aurangzeb in favorable terms, because then, of course, you're going to be marked as a bigot and all that. So this is the reality, and we have to live with it, because academia is not going to open up for everyone. The, what, the classroom lectures are not going to reach out to everyone. 
So and not everyone is going to read and pick up Supriya Gandhi's book or my book and figure out what exactly these people were like. So we have to live with that reality. And this politics is going to go on because it, it, it works dividends for political parties of whatever persuasion. So you invoke Dara Shiko, you invoke Tipu Sultan in, 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 in Karnataka, and one administration holds him up as an icon, the other comes in, and then, of course, demolishes him completely. So this is going to go on, because identity politics is at the center of Indian politics today. So obviously, if it's, you are going to look at people only as Hindus and Muslims and Christians. You're not going to look at them as Indian kings. OK, now, of course, even Ashoka is being talked about as a Buddhist king. There have been so many right-wing voices that diminish him completely, dismiss him completely, saying that, oh, he was a Buddhist king. Uh, so that's going to go on. We cannot help it. And the religion has always been used by people. Akbar used it. Um, he loved, like I have named my book Allahu Akbar for a specific reason, because Akbar loved it. Because uh, in one way it means, of course, the basic meaning is God is great. But in a twisted way, it can also mean Akbar, Akbar is Allah. Yeah. And similarly, if you see, uh, when Mr. Modi was campaigning as the prime ministerial candidate in 2014 in Banaras, when he goes to file his nomination papers, people start calling, uh, raising the slogan of Har Har Modi. Har Har Mahadev becomes Har Har Modi. So that religion has always been used by people throughout the ages. It's just that our understanding tends to be shaped more by the present than by the past. Supriya, one last question before we open it out to the sure. audience. There's often this. Um, uh, not least, I think, in, uh, in your father's play. Um, this, uncle's, uh, uncle's, uncle's play, I mean, sorry. Uh, this idea that if only Dara had, had won the war of succession, partition wouldn't have happened. India would be a happy, united country. Is there any basis at all for, for that, that, that idea? Uh, you know, I think, I think it's hard to say that. And I think, you know, as your book also shows, uh, you know, the reason for the East India Company's ascendancy in colonialism, etc., rests on a, such a series of historical accidents that would have been impossible to avert, you know, no matter who would have been the Mughal emperor. And if, I think that if actually... If only Siraj Adal would remember to cover the powder and Yes, plenty, yes, uh, of course. So I think that really speaks more to our own times, to the... To the ever-present role of these kings and, sort of, and emperors and would-be emperors uh, in our own day uh, than to actually what might have happened. So how should we remember Dara? Last question before we open it up. How would you, if you had a last little nugget to give to the audience for how they should think of Dara? Uh, as a philosopher prince who always wanted to be emperor, not a naive mystic with his head in the clouds. Thank you. Questions? And, uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Agranil Mandal. Um, my question is that what people wanted, like from Baba to uh, from Baba to Aurangzeb, we have seen that they all were uh, military rulers, and like they most foc mostly focused on uh, military things, and there was generalships, conquering, and all. So, do people wanted peace? So that's why they preferred Dara in place of Aurangzeb. Thank you. Yes. So, so the question is, did, did people want peace? And is that why they preferred Dara instead of Aurangzeb? Did they want an emperor who was less interested in conquest uh, than an Aurangzeb? Uh, so you know, the thing is, um, uh, you know, th there was the idea of the emperor as someone who ensured the stability and peace uh, of the entire kingdom. Uh, and there are many, many ways of, uh, of doing that. Uh, and actually, you know, to an extent, conquest was a way of doing that. So, so I'm not sure that Dara uh, sold himself as this figure who would bring about peace in that sense. Uh, he would, uh, he did have a vision of kind of harmonizing in his own person uh, the, the sort of various, the dif different religious strands that would actually give him a special kind of spiritual perception so that he, you know, to make him a better emperor. Yeah. This lady in the front row here. The lady in the front row here, please. Thank you. If you feel secular is a modern word that we didn't know earlier, in one word, how would you describe Akbar's politics? Tolerant is a good alternative, I think. And that's how it was. The gentleman with grey hair behind the... You see, if we think about, think about times, then Akbar was totally a different man. When he was 17, 
then Portuguese in Goa put Bible in the uh, around in, on a donkey's head and roamed it in whole of Goa. Then Mahamanika told him that you put the um, Quran Sharif, sorry, but not Bible. You put the Bible on donkey's head and move it in whole of Agra. He refused. He said, I will punish those people who have insulted Quran. I will a not... Que a question, sir, rather than the statement, please. Do you have a question? You see, I, my question is that you, when we compare, uh, good things are all right, but you should also think, was Dara's fit to rule? His philosophy was all right. He would have been a good philosopher. But would have he, he would have been a good ruler? The question is, was, was Dara fit to rule? Was he fit to rule? Uh, well, he, so he, Aurangzeb was probably more skilled at managing men. Aurangzeb had that experience, but Dara was actually developing that experience. He was very interested in statecraft. Uh, he did need a little bit more military experience, uh, which he sadly got when it was too late. If I can just add to that, this ep episode happened at Hormuz, not in Goa, where the Portuguese had put uh, a Quran and tied it around the neck of a dog and let it loose in a market. And it was Hamida Bano Begum, not Mahamanga, who said that, why don't you do the same? Here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question for Supriya. Uh, do you think Dara was less cruel than uh, Aurangzeb if he would have been emperor? Because I think there are some farmans which have been, uh, uh, you know, translated from Persian and they are lying in a uh, Bikari museum and they, they claim that Dara Shiko had also ordered for the head of uh, Aurangzeb, would he uh, be able to win over Aurangzeb? So do you think he was, uh, he would have been less cruel than uh, Aurangzeb? Uh, yeah, so uh, the actual, the way in which Mughal succession played out was actually by vanquishing one's brothers. You know, one's blood brothers eventually were one's potential enemies in the, in the race for the throne. So in that case, yes, I mean, Dara Shoko, uh, was bent on vanquishing his brothers, you know, at the cost of their lives. So that is probably something that couldn't have been avoided, and Shah Jahan too had a, a sort of often forgotten, very bloody route to the throne as well. Um, this gentleman here. Hi. Um, my question is that when we read... Oh, sorry. When we read biographies of historical figures, it is very evident that there is bias in all kinds of biographies for the same historical figure. So as an academic, how do I find the distinction or how do I find the unbiased view of a historical figure through only biased texts? Mm. So you're so saying that, that our sources, our primary sources for these historical figures each have their own bias. So how do you actually find out the truth when all of these sources are coming at, you know, from a particular angle? So, you know, so I'm not sure, you know, quite about the truth, but what one actually can do is to look at representation. So read between the lines and, and sort of, and, and situate one's sources. Who is writing this? Why is he or she saying this? And I think that helps us get more, something that's more like a mosaic rather than a unified view, but we can get different angles that help us. Gentlemen in the front row here. Uh, my question to both... Uh, Mani Mugda and Supriya. Uh, William Rudolph has uh, worked very, in, uh, very hard to see the Rajput plans of uh, Akbar's Rajput plan, and he has written authoritatively that Akbar married off his sons to the Rajput princess. Because once this is done, all the Rajput kings would be under his thumb. So looking, I mean. Taking uh, the theory advanced by William Rudolph, how do you rate Emperor Akbar as a secular person? Emperor as a, as as a, a secular, secular person. Secular person. Um, like I said, sir, um, secular is a very modern word, but he was definitely tolerant. He was remarkably open-minded. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And... Uh, um, we do see his open-mindedness uh, in various episodes of his life. And we have to understand that Akbar's, like everyone else's, was a complete personality. It evolved. When he was very young, he behaved in a certain way. 
when he was in his 20s, mid-20s, late 20s, he behaved in a different way because he was coming in contact with various other cultures and various other people. So when he starts marrying Hindu women and uh, his outlook towards life changes a bit and he starts adopting Hindu practices which are anathema to many of the orthodox people in his court. For instance, he's applying tilak on his birthdays. He is wearing the kaleva like the Hindus do. And uh, he's also, uh, later in his life, he also chants 1001 names of the sun god because a Jain priest tells him that, that you should do that, it's good for you. So he's doing, he's experimenting with all those things. Is he naive? Do you get the impression he's, you know, he's, he's not uh, literate? Do you get the impression uh, no, that he's... No, I, I don't think he was naive at all. I mean, he, he was successful, more successful than others in whatever he did because the past structure was such that because he just had one rival that was Mirza Muhammad Hakim, who, of course, there were rebellions by him and some time of his was spent in crushing that rebellion as well. He was not naive, certainly not, because these were, he was very curious. He was a very curious man. When we say Akbar was illiterate, now there are the new researchers that say that actually that was not the case. He could read and write. There's, in fact, a paper that was presented at the Indian History Congress this year, and we will see what, uh, uh, on what it's based on. But uh, there are some scholars that say that, no, he was act he could read and write. He, was, he probably had dyslexia. But again, that view is also contested because that's just one person who had come up with that theory that he probably was dyslexic. That has been challenged by academia as well. So he was not naive. He was very clever. And uh, he was very open-minded. He had no qualms about trying new things in life. Okay? And uh, we see... That you, you get the impression that not, it isn't just that he develops, he, he's, he sometimes radically keeps changing his ideas. He can't Absolutely. Make up his mind and, and also he wanted to be accepted by the Hindus as someone uh, whom they could look up to. Jagat Bec Guru. Uh, he makes Jagat, he gives the title Jagat Guru to Ajayan, uh, Hira Vijaya Suri and all those people. And uh, there's one incident that happens in Gujarat after he has uh, defeated the Mirzas. Uh, you have this drunken party that happens and everyone gets drunk and all the Rajputs are talking about their bravado and they say that, you know, you know even, we Raj, even then, even then, yes, they said that we are so brave and two Rajput warriors, when they want to fight, what they would do, they would put a spear through themselves so that they could be as close as possible and then they would have the sword duel. And Akbar, because he's completely drunk and he says, no, I am also as brave as a Rajput, I'm going to do the same thing. So he puts a sword on the wall he fixes it, and then he tries to run <laughs> into the sword, and then he's stopped by Raja Man Singh, and then, then he gets angry at Man Singh. He says, why did you take away the chance of bravery from me? So, you know, he's, in that we see that he is trying to be accepted. I mean, that's a very foolish, a very reckless thing to do, but then <laughs> so he's, he's part of the club, okay? And he's trying to get acceptance as, as, as a Rajput, because the, before then, Muslim kings were called as mlechas, you know, they are outsiders, they are savages. So here Akbar is being, and if you see that he's being compared to Karna and then he's called the avatar of Vishnu, obviously that has worked, eventually. So, uh, yeah. The lady over here. Hi, Supriya ma'am, my question is for you. This may be a little off topic and it's not related to Akbar or Dara Sikho, it's related to you. So I'm a fan of your writing and more of your poised and calm personality. And you hail from a family of the INC, which started in 1885. So how do you see this? What are you, your views? Would you be ever joining the Indian politics and making a difference? I don't know, is, does this work? Uh, I think this is probably a bad time for people with my surname to be joining Indian politics, <laughs> you know, in terms of electoral politics. Uh, not a good time for dynasties either. Not a good time for dynasties, no. But I think, you know, my political intervention is really through my scholarship. And uh, the promotion of the humanities, protection of our universities is something that I stand for very strongly. Thank you, thank you. One last question. Gentleman with the hand raised. Yeah, standing up. Uh, yeah. uh, hello, my question is for Supriya, ma'am. Uh, I, I remember reading one of your articles in the Open magazine and you mm -hmm. had mentioned that uh, uh, it is a famous thought experiment in our times to imagine what it would have, would, what it would have been like if Dara would have become the emperor. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, know your thoughts that 
what does our fascination with these philosopher kings tell about the vices of our contemporary democracy? Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think, you know, an argument that I make is that these, these kings and these royals are ever present among us. Uh, and, they tell, and, the, and they're present, uh, you know, in not, not uh, in a very complex form, but as proxies for various ideological positions. So say, you know, Akbar might connote something, Aurangzeb might connote something else. So to call someone Aurangzeb is an insult, you don't even need to explain that. Uh, so it's really the ways in which we're, we're so fascinated with kings, I think, is quite telling about our current uh, a political climate, uh, and indeed we also anoint our politicians uh, as kings uh, in, in various cases. So I think uh, the way in which the language of kingship is inflecting our politics today is something that we ought to examine. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a big round of applause for Mani Dama and Supriya Gandhi. Uh, all three of us, I think, are going to be signing books now. Uh, so if any of you have any more questions, feel free to ask it there after you've bought a book. <laughs> Once again, thank you to Supriya Gandhi, Mani Mukta Sharma, and William Dalrymple, and also for presenting the session to the Murti Classical Library of India of Harvard University Press. As William said, all three authors will be signing books. You can pick their books up at the JCB Prize for Literature Bookshop, managed by Full Circle, and they will meet you here at the back of the Nexa front lawn, at, in the far right corner, where you'll find the Z kiosk. That is where the book signing is taking place. And coming up next, here at the Nexa front lawn, in 10 minutes, we have a book launch. The launch is The Vault of Vishnu by Ashwin Sanghi. The launch will be by Sonali Bendre Behel. And that book launch is presented by the Bank of Baroda. We'll be going into that launch in just a few minutes. Thank you.